have an interesting subject, don't we, this evening? How the New Testament came to each one of us. Well, I'm sure you all know the, the Old Testament starts with the description of the creation of this earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm sure you also know that the New Testament also starts with a creation. Not in the same way as God creating the heavens and the earth, but one of a creation that we can see in our day, uh, in, in our lives today, the, the birth of a baby. Around 2,000 years ago, a little baby called Jesus was born, the son of a woman and the son of God. This little body, uh, this little um, baby, this boy was watched, he was followed, he was misunderstood, he was admired, and eventually he was crucified. And in some senses, this is very similar to that, what we're doing to the planet Earth. A number of people called the disciples and later the apostles followed and believed in the Lord Jesus. They wrote down stories concerning the life of the Lord Jesus and some of the letters that were written to the churches. And these were written in just a few years after Jesus was on earth, while they were preaching and while they were setting up the early believing groups. Our thoughts this evening are around how these works have been passed down throughout the ages, resulting in the second half of this book that we have before us to be with us today. Now I won't be dogmatic about some of the dates uh, this evening, but I'll, what I will give you are the generally agreed dates of these books. But as with a lot of history, some of these dates can only be accurate to within a small tolerance. It's because no one can be definite about every piece of detail. The dates and the translations can all be debated to some degree. And I have to say, I'm not a Greek scholar or a historian, just someone who has tried to gather as much information as I could around the subject of this New Testament. Information that you yourselves can go and find out. So how is the, 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 uh, the New Testament structured? Well, the 27 books of the New Testament can be split up into a number of categories. Firstly, we have the first books, which primarily focus on the life of the Lord Jesus, and they are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Secondly, we have the journeys of the apostles in Acts and Romans. Thirdly, we have the letters written by a few different people, such as Paul, John and James. And finally, we have the revelation of Jesus written down by John. But who wrote each of these books? Well, the general acceptance of the writers of the New Testament are as follows. We can see Matthew, Mark and Luke and John are written by themselves, and John's written uh, a number of letters and also uh, Revelation. Peter writing Peter 1 and 2, James and Jude uh, writing their own letters. Now we see that Paul wrote uh, a significant portion of the New Testament uh, with a slight um, debate of whether he wrote Hebrews. Now due to the style and the contents of each of these books, they are obviously written by different people, in different places and at different times. And they generally agreed dates when these, uh, these books were written are as follows. I won't read each of them, but hopefully you can see them on the screen. What I tried to do is illustrate the, the potential earliest and latest and, and the most likely dates. So Galatians in AD 48, Mark somewhere between AD 48 and 55, Corinthians in AD 55 and 56, Romans in AD 57, uh, Philippians in 60 and 62, Titus around 63, uh, Jude around 65 to 80, and we can go on, can't we? Now, although I mentioned that some of these dates may be out by a small tolerance, it's almost certain that each of the books in the New Testament were written before 100 AD, which means that the books that were written, that we can read for us, were written in the lifetime of the witnesses of the written Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you a couple of verses which speak about this. So in Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, we read these words. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory, 
when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So by accepting that these words were written, that we can read ourselves, were written before 100 AD, and some much earlier, we can understand that these were eyewitnesses that we would just read about in those two verses, that they would have had knowledge of the New Testament and the New Testament writings, and they would therefore have read and scrutinised them. If anything was untoward, then you can imagine that they would have destroyed them and our New Testament would have looked very different. They may well have done this for other letters that we do not know about. Now there are three sources of information that we can track back in history to understand how the New Testament was created and how the words which we can read in these pages uh, have, been, have been created. So the three sources are manuscripts, early versions, different versions of those manuscripts. And we can also see that there will be writings from other people in the first and second century. So how were all these books amalgamated? Well, there are, to be honest, very few documents that describe a compilation of the books within the New Testament within those first few years. The thing that can be sure is that it would be the believers who would have collated these books together. It would have been either those people who would have copied or ordered the copying of the manuscripts in order that they be kept safe and circulated to other ecclesias for their learning. But how was it this, these 27 books? How was it approved back in, in those early days? Well, during the early years after our Lord Jesus Christ, there were some who wanted to destroy these manuscripts. They wanted to be an obstacle in the new religious movement. Most of these attacks came in the form of what is known as the heretical doctrine. Now Paul in, um, in Hebrews reads, uh, writes these words in chapter 13 and verse 9. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now one of the, well, uh, the most well-known early attacks of the New Testament scripture was from someone called Marcion in around 140 AD. While rejecting the Old Testament, he attempted to make his, make his own canon, which is a list of books considered to be inspired by God. And he tried to form what is known as a sacred scripture. He only used a subset of the New Testament books that we have today. But it's because of what he did and what he tried to do meant that the church felt that they had to respond with the real list of books that should be declared and deemed the New Testament and the, tr the true New Testament. And in doing so, they set a number of rules in order for a book to be listed in the canon of Scripture. Already at this time, there were two separate collections, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and what was known as the Pauline Corpus, which were the letters written by Paul. Both of these collections were already regarded by the church as inspired works, and in 115 AD, the Bishop of Antioch mentioned these collections in his, in his work. Near to the end of the second century, the content of the New Testament canon was already set, and there was strong er evidence of this in the Muratorian fragment. It refers to the Gospel of Luke as the third, and therefore by default there were two beforehand, which was Matthew and Mark, and then the Gospel of John. It lists the 13 epistles of Paul, epistles of Jude, John and Revelation, are all listed as the scriptures within this fragment. There's a man called Origen, who lived and worked in the third century. He was one of the great teachers of the church. And he said that the church had four gospels and heretics had a lot of them. Then Origen enumerates the list of canonical books, Paul's 13 epistles, Peter, John and Revelation. And he further stated at this time that there was an issue about the canonicity of the epistle of, of Hebrews, 2 Peter and 3 John, James and Jude. This was obviously something that was subsequently cleared up. Eusebius of Caesarea was a great Christian historian who wrote in the first uh, church, uh, first century in the early, the early sorry, the, the church history. This was a book which you can re yourselves read. And Eusebius lists this as all the New Testament books in the, as they were the canon. He said that these books were questioned by some, but were generally accepted by Christians at that time. 
In 368, Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, sent, a letter, uh, sent the churches a letter with an Easter greeting, and there he writes all 27 of the books which we know in the New Testament today. So even back as early as the 1st, 2nd and 3rd century, we read, we read documents about the whole New Testament. At the Council of Hippo, which took place in AD 393, and at the Council of Carthage in 397, they approved all 27 books as the books that made up the New Testament scriptures. These councils were not at the point where the 27 books were approved. This happened many years earlier, um, but they were just another occasion that it's documented that the New Testament as it was, it was as it is now. And so we could go on. The 27 books have been under a microscope by so many, and these 27 books were approved by so many, even in those early few years. But I'm sure also that the angels had guidance of the scripture that has enabled, enabled us to have the scripture we have before us. Now based on the slide I'm about to show you on the screen, we can see that the most notable English versions have been translated over the years, and until the recent explosion of the different versions that have been created in the last few years. This slide shows the resources that each of the versions were based on, and therefore it helps us to understand the accuracy of these versions. And we'll look at just a few stories behind each of these versions which you may recognise. So you can see that the, the manuscripts and the versions and the earlier items all have gone into the different versions that we, we can read ourselves. Now the, the Bible which was written by Wycliffe, after a number of early Anglo-Saxon versions, there was a long pause in history in respect to different um, Bible translations. After the Battle of Hastings, the, the Saxon clergy were replaced by the priests of Normandy. This new religious order had little respect for the relics and Saxon manuscripts and had little desire to spread the knowledge of the scriptures among the people. And it continued like this for centuries. Wycliffe had a very interesting life, not an easy one. He was put on trial a number of times, the first few being postponed. The charge was that he was attacking the church of the land. He firmly believed that the common people should have access to the very thing that anyone in the world today can hold in their hand, the scriptures. He believed that the first few disciples and those first few uh, first century Christians spread the word of God, and he wanted to continue that access to the truth. At that current time, it was a privilege to have access to the Bible and understand the Latin. And he wanted that privilege to be spread to all England, and he tried to translate it into common day English. Along with some help from Nicholas de Herod from Oxford, he translated over half of the Old Testament. Wycliffe completed a translation of the Old Testament and the whole of the New Testament, work which took eight years and was revised by a man called Richard Purvey, a friend of his. This version that we can see in the diagra diagram was translated from the Latin, from the Vulgate. And although this was a huge step forward for the English Bible, this translation did not take into account the original he Greek and Hebrew. So no matter how perfect this translation was, it was naturally going to carry over the errors of the Vulgate Latin. But it was as good as the source and the knowledge was at that time. And Wycliffe still, and the, the translations that Wycliffe gave, gave are still um, very well-known phrases that we can read in our Bibles today. But sadly in 1384 he was sick of the palsy and he died. But that was not the end of Wycliffe's legacy. <coughs> People still slurred his name and anyone who was found with Wycliffe's Bible was hunted and killed. There were even those who wanted the Pope to grant an order to dig up his grave and rebury him in a dunghill. Luckily, that did not happen. But due to the methods of rewriting Wycliffe's translation, mainly the wealthier people were those who had possession. And even today, there are still 170 copies remaining in this, in the, that you can see. And his words are now immortalised in a digital world. His translation will now never be forgotten. Around 100 years passed on before the next major step forward came, and this was in the form of William Tyndale. Up to this point, learning and reading was from parchment, but during this time something changed the world forever. This is uh, the legend, perhaps one, one version of the story, I'm sure there are many others, 
that some 20 years later, after Wycliffe's death, there was a boy living in Metz in Germany with the name Johann Geinsflesch, which means John Gooseflesh. He was playing in the fields, messing around with the bark cutting, and carved as, as kids do, carving his name into the bark. Taking his handicraft back to his home, he started playing with some dye by the fire. Accidentally dropping one of the letters in the dye, he then tried to retrieve it, and while doing so, dropped it onto some white cloth, which created the idea which changed the world's literature forever. While admiring the, the bee character on the white cloth, he looked carefully at what had happened. And some 30 years later, around 1450, Johann Gutenberg, was now using his mother's maiden name and not his father, was in the printing business, and he had completed the first ever printed Bible. How true this legend is, I'll, I'll leave it up for your own investigations. But the fact remains that the printing press had changed the world's literature, and it meant that a book such as Weicker's Bible, which had already been considered to be around, say, £40 of today's money, in comparison with this new technique, the Bible would only be one penny. It was therefore 4,000 times cheaper. Around this time there was also a revival of the Greek understanding. And it was people such as Erasmus, having a huge knowledge, worked in Cambridge. And it was here that William Tyndale, who studied at Oxford, met Erasmus. Like Wycliffe, Tyndale argued and stood against the priests of the day. One reference states that Tyndale's vow was to make the plough or the ploughman in England know more of the scripture than the Pope does. Again, like Wycliffe, Tyndale wanted the scriptures to be accessible to all people, to allow everyone to be able to read the word of God. So Tyndale continued to use the, the sources and the resources at his disposal. A greater wealth of manuscripts had never been used before for an English Bible. And for over a year he worked on the meticulous piece of translation that he tried. But the piece was not to last. As the leaders of the day, just as the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day, saw their hold on the people fading away. People were led to prison and put to death for reading the Vulgate translation of the Bible, trying to learn for themselves. So Tyndale needing a lot of space for all those manuscripts required for an accurate translation, and knowing about this new method of printing, left England in 1524, never to return. After some trouble, he escaped to Worms and designed and produced a, a, for the first time a printed New Testament in English, in English. He sent as many copies as he could back to England and it was estimated that around 6,000 copies were printed at Worms. Books were sent back in barrels, in bales of cloth, in sacks of flour and although the ports were watched by many, many copies spread throughout the country of England. Tyndale, who was now nearly broke, had a very fortunate turn of events. The Bishop of London had, had a very bright idea. He thought that by buying all the copies from Tyndale, then he would be sure that he could burn them and stop them from circulating around the country. However, for Tyndale, this meant that he had a sudden windfall, or a big bonus as you, as you like, and pulled him out of debt. This bright idea of the Bishop suddenly enabled Tyndale to continue the very thing that he wanted to stop, and the books continued to spread into England. Tyndale's opponents, seeing that he could no lo they could no longer resist the people reading, changed tact and started trying to discredit the work, and that there were many errors and it was not worth reading. Many people believed them, as it was hard to fight against word of mouth in those days, many, many years before the internet. However, there were those who were called the Friends of the Reformation, and they defended the book. They defended William Tyndale's work, as it had now completed his vow. The Bible was open to all, and everyone was talking about it, and everyone tried to read it. But sadly for Tyndale, he never saw that day, because on Friday the 6th of October in 1536, he was strangled at the stake and burned to the ashes as he prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He devoted most of his time translating the New Testament, along with a few of the Old Testament books. He wrote a commentary alongside his translation, a commentary which doesn't remain in the future translations, but nonetheless we can still read his words and we can understand his feelings towards the church of the day. As William Tyndale prayed as he was put to death, he prayed for his faith that the, that the King of England's eyes would be opened, and his prayer was later answered as along came the Coverdale, Matthews and the Great Bible 
each with their own stories, which I'll leave, leave you to read for yourselves. But I'd like to just point out a few attributes of the Geneva Bible. This was mainly based on the work of, of William Tyndale, but the font was changed to that which we know today, the Roman type font. It was also the first split in scripture into verses that we know today. And it was also the first book to change the words that were not in the original into italics. But in January 1604, a conference of the bishop and clergy was held in the drawing rooms of Hampton Court Palace, under the presidency of King James, to consider the grievances of the church and the subject of the different current translations of the Geneva, the bishops and the Great Bible. These problems could not be resolved, and so there was a need for a new version to be accepted by all classes and all parties. A set of rules were drawn up that if the, the revisers disagreed on any passage, they would have a meeting to discuss. All commentary would be removed, and only notes in the margin would contain explanations of the Greek and the Hebrew original words. Using these rules bound all the classes in England together. The revisers, the revisers were divided into six parties, each with their own portion, studying carefully the section that they were responsible, reading old translations as well as other translations in Spanish, French and German to see if the meanings would help shed light on difficult translations. And seven long years later, in 1611, the authorised version was completed. The most researched, the most widely cross-checked and the most used Bible than ever before a work that we can still understand and many read today. And so if the authorised version was so good, then why was there a need for a, a revised version? Well, for one, the authorised version itself was a revision of previous translations. Whenever there was more information or, or better information at hand, better revisions can be obviously be made. And this was the case for the revised version. Over those 400 years between these last two uh, books which we can read, there was now a wealth of manuscripts that were not known in King James's day. The science of textual criticism had progressed. Scholars had a better, better understanding of the ancient languages. Our language has changed. Words which in the English may not be used or have mean, their meanings changed through time. All these reasons paved the way for the revised version. And this is what the revisers did. They had the authorised version printed in the middle and made notes of the original Greek on the left and the English translation comments on the right. If after a group had any comments on a passage, it would be discussed and agreed. The version was then sent to America and reviewed, and suggestions were made. And after seven editions and ten years later, in 1880, the revised version was completed. Now, as we know, since then, and very recently, a number of versions have now been made available, with the English Standard Version, the, the ISV, etc., None have made such groundbreaking changes than those that were considered that we've considered today. The modern versions were generally updated to allow an easier read than the authorised and revised versions, and in some cases moving further away from the original text. Now after all that work had been gone into these versions, we have to be honest and point out that there may still be a few issues of any translations that we use. And some of these reasons are as follows. We are still human. No one is perfect and people do make mistakes. However, after all the revisions and the number of people of these translations, these mistakes will only be minor. Lost sections. Some books in the New Testament have more copies than others and can therefore be cross-checked and verified far easier than some of the uh, books that only have a couple of remaining early writings. Overwritten documents. Some of the, the manuscripts from, from the first century have been copied over and therefore a lot of technology had to be used in order to, uh, to read the overwritten words. Text alongside translations have helped to understand the translations but perhaps sometimes can cause confusion over time. And the change of meaning. This perhaps is the biggest threat to our understanding of the scriptures. As we've seen, a lot of work has gone into these translations from many different available sources. However, the English language changes over time, doesn't it? And some words have become obsolete in our language. One example is the word coney, which appears two times in the Old Testament, meaning a species of rock rabbit. But does, does this mean that we should continue to update the words, just because we no longer use them? I don't think so. A much simpler way would be to learn the meaning of the original words itself. 
Think of Shakespeare. We still learn and teach these words, don't we, in its raw form, much to disgust of many teenagers. And the final one, as I'm sure you're aware, not every language has a direct word which can be mapped in translation to another language. I'm sure you've all, um, I tried to think of some examples of this. I'm, I'm sure we've all heard the, the rumour that Eskimos have far more words than snow than we do. So I thought I'd look, look this up and found that this was a complete myth, as we have the words such as snowdrift and snowstorm. So I continued to look for a, a modern example of how some words um, don't translate into other languages. On Easter Island, they have the word called tinga, which describes the act of taking objects one desires from the house of a friend by gradually borrowing all of them. <laughs> In Scotland, they use the word tartle, which describes the act of hesitating while introducing someone because you've forgotten their name. I'm sure Lydia calls me a tartle all the time. And this is my favourite. In Czech, there is a word prosvonit, which is a word which describes someone phoning a mobile for just one ring in order for that... Uh, caller to call them back on the missed call, saving the originator caller the charge. But with all these differences and all these concerns that we may have, can it still be trusted? Many questions can be raised of whether we can trust the New Testament. These questions can continue and continue. However, what we should do is answer these questions by looking at the evidence. Firstly, historical events within the scriptures. There have been a number of events within scriptures which has backed up the events in history by using archaeology. And we have a talk uh, in just a few days on archaeology. And that may help us to understand how archaeology can help uh, understand the Bible and believe it. We have links back to the Old Testament. There are countless links back to the, to the first book of, uh, or the first portion in our Bible. Not just actual uh, references, but also themes that continue to flow from the Old Testament to the New. A piece of work which, without inspiration of God, would be impossible. We have prophecy. Since the books were written, there have been a number of prophecies that have been fulfilled. One of the prophecies is AD 70, in which the Romans overthrew Jerusalem. Others include the prophecies in Revelation, which speaks about the, the end of the Romans as it stood. And the amount of documentation this also gives us quite a good amount of evidence of whether we should trust the New Testament. No one questions whether Aristotle's work is real, and there are only 49 um, portions of his readings today. No one, questions, no one questions whether Julius Caesar was there, and there was only 10 copies of his writings. However, for the New Testament, we have not 7, or 10, or 49, but we have over 5,600 known Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. We have 10,000 Latin Vulgates and another 9,300 early works, giving us around 24,000 manuscripts or portions of the New Testament in existence. So what have we learned today together? We have considered the historical gatherings of the scriptures, the various early copies of the scripture and the New Testament, and the different translations that we now have access to. Many people have lost their lives in an attempt to enable people to have the opportunity to read God's word. They have tirelessly translated the words with the best of their ability and tried to put the word and the message of God into the reach of the masses. So on that basis, quite a number of people have both understood the word of God. They have wanted people like you and I to read it. And as Christadelphians, this is the first thing that we would encourage you to do. Above all of the books and all of the commentaries, around God's word. We implore you to read God's word first and find out what it says in an unbiased point of view. We are Bible students and we try to encourage questions whenever we don't understand. And this is perhaps one area where we differ quite, quite a lot from other Christian groups. So what was the message that these people wanted us to read? Well, you may have been taught the Lord's Prayer. So let's have a look at what this actually tells us. The Lord Jesus gives this template for us to pray. So in Matthew 6 verse 7 we read, Hallowed be thy name. So first we are told to praise God. Give us this day our daily bread. We are told to ask God for our needs. Forgive our debts. We are told to ask God for forgiveness when we do things that are wrong. As we forgive those debtors, our debtors. So we are told to show that same mercy 
to others around us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're told to ask God to give us strength to do things that are, are right, to not do things which are wrong in his sight. These are all ways in which we should lead our lives. But there's also a couple of references to, a king, to the kingdom. <coughs> so again, within this prayer, Thy kingdom come, and thine will be thy kingdom, and thine will be done on earth as it is. Sorry, thy kingdom come, and thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. These two parts of the famous prayer, known throughout the world, is a key part to our scripture. There are numerous passages about the kingdom of God, with Jesus coming back to this earth to become the king of that kingdom with the power of God. The Lord's Prayer clearly states that the kingdom of God and that it will that we should pray for it to come. Not somewhere that we may go to, but it will come. And that is the last, uh, as the world states, it will be forever. So as a conclusion, we are truly blessed with having the book before us, both the Old Testament and the New, a book that has cost people's lives to ensure that future generations would have the ability to read it. We now are in a country whereby we are able to read these words without fear of our lives, without anyone looking over our shoulders and persecuting us. And by the use of the internet, we can read it for free in many, many different versions. I have no doubt that God's messengers, his angels, had a part of the preservation of the scriptures over the past few thousand years. A book that's had more history than any other. A book that's had more copies than any other. Something that surely is no coincidence. The evidence that this book is God's word should inspire us to read its pages, to understand God's plan and understand how we can become a part of it. In our introductory reading we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3. So if you come with me to those words please. And we'll just reread a couple of those verses. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For this for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in the last days we see that so many likenesses to the world around us, don't we, in the world today. This tells us surely that we are in those last days, the last days before the Lord Jesus will return and judge the world. But we are encouraged in that same chapter, so if you drop down to verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we have this scripture be t uh, in our hands today, don't we? Scripture which is inspired by God to learn from, to help us to correct our ways for instruction, for righteousness. I started our thoughts today by referring to the fact that the New Testament started with the story of a baby being born. A baby who grew to be a man and who saved the world by leading a sinless life and laid down his life as a sacrifice for all mankind. And this story has been saved and preserved for us for 2,000 years. But this story has not yet been completed. What I didn't mention is that the Lord Jesus was raised back to life and he currently sits at the right hand of God. In the Bible we read that Jesus will come back to earth to set up God's kingdom here on earth. And we can be a part of it should we choose to read, should we choose to be baptised and lead the life that God wants us to. Just as Jesus was raised back to life, this world will also be brought back to life in its former glory. Not a world that hum humankind is killing, sucking the resources out and polluting it, but a world where there will be no famine no lack of fuel and no death. Whether we choose to accept or ignore God's plan, he has allowed us to make that choice by allowing scripture to be passed down through the years. I pray that you will read it, that you will understand how God wants to lead our lives, 
and that you will understand there is only one way for salvation. Thank you for listening.